Standing up in McKinney. This is, according to Callus, episode 660, coming to you on the 21st day of June, the year of our Lord, 2024. And today we're going to do the five stages of grief related to elections. Yes. So, uh, and I, I want to be uh, straight up, this is somewhat tongue in cheek. So, before we get there, let me remind you the best way that we can continue to be heard, grow the show, make a difference, impact the area we live in, and quite frankly, be effective, is to like, share, subscribe, follow the program. Join me on the social media of your choice. I currently have a page in a group over at Facebook. I'm a pro at Gab. I drop in at MeWe. For now, the program is still up audio-wise at YouTube, and you can find the program at your podcatcher of choice. So here we go on with the show. All right, so now we, we finally finished the election cycle for now, keeping in mind in Less than five months, we have the general election, and that's going to be all sorts of special when we get there. But for right now, we completed the Texas primary for all the partisan races, including the runoffs and the municipal races and their corresponding runoffs. So we've had four elections in the space of about three months. Now, there's some Serious voter fatigue for a good number of people. All right. But in that, I digress, right? The The underlying thing that everybody needs to keep in mind here is when you have a city of 90,000 people that decides election with 3,500 people, that is not a mandate. That is a reflection of the... <laughs> people just don't care. But... Again, I digress. Sorry. I'm parched. All right. So <clears throat> the stages of grief applied to elections. Now, the first stage is denial. What's interesting is if you remember the 2000 election, the Democrats were in denial. The 2016 election, the Democrats were in denial. The 2020 election, the Democrats would say the Republicans were in denial. And without a doubt, there was some denial involved, but there was legitimate, still yet to be proven, but legitimate shenanigans that went on in front of God and country. But again, still denial because we accepted it as a loss or by better way to phrase it is it was presented as a loss. Some of us haven't truly accepted that that's what occurred. Only that resident Biden is there. So you get this denial thing, right? Nobody wants to believe that they lost. And look, I want to be honest. I went through all this to a degree myself because I had my own campaign once upon a time. And I've known plenty of other people that have had campaigns. Some have won. Some have lost. Some have done both. I guess technically now I have done both. That being said, once you get past the denial, you move on to anger. Now, anger is interesting because there are different ways that everybody approaches anger, right? Some people get violent, they lash out. Some people just don't get violent, but lash out. And some people internalize it all and do crazy things to themselves or perhaps outlandish things occur. It's it's different for everybody, right? Now, anger is a great motivator, right? And if you take part in an election and you think the election was legitimately stolen, or even if you illegitimately believe that an election was stolen, Q Democrats 2000 and 2016, it still activates you. It gets you interested. It You put that anger to good use. Now, presumably, you still go through the remaining 
three stages, but that anger motivates you. The anger gets you involved, gets you interested. And there's a part two of this equation, which depending on how long it takes me to get through the first five of the election um, stages of grief, we're going to call it the activist stages of grief. But here we go. The election. So you're in your anger phase. And from there, you move on into the bargaining. Now, this is where it gets interesting. A lot of folks, I don't believe, actually get out of the bargaining stage. And I see this play out, quite frankly, in a lot of organizations. Well, if we just vote harder, if we just work harder, if we just do more of whatever we did the first time, somehow that's going to make the difference. We'll just, we'll find a way. It's bargaining, right? If I do this, maybe this won't happen in the future. If I do that, maybe this won't happen. You know, you're looking for a way to negotiate the outcome. It doesn't matter. It's already done. It's over with. You can't undo what happened. And a lot of times it stinks, but that's just the way it is, right? So once you've gone into that bargaining stage, then you move on into the depression. Now, some people experience a really hard, heavy depression. Some people, it's short. Some people, it's long. Some people go into a depression that turns into a tailspin and they never quite get out. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. That's that's a bad place to be. But that depression is a way of processing what happened, what was wrong, you know, maybe people just don't like me. You know, whatever it is, that's that's what you're working through, right? You're trying to make sense of what occurred. Ideally, so it doesn't happen again. So you get a better outcome in the future. I mean, that would be the goal, right? When you go through your depression, you cope through this, and then you come through on the other side, That that's your acceptance, right? Stage five, acceptance. So I accepted at this point, and and even if you're looking at this, not from the standpoint of a candidate, but just somebody that was involved in the campaign, somebody that was deeply invested in their preferred candidate winning, when you accept, okay, it's done, it's over with, we didn't get the outcome we wanted. Once you've accepted that, then you can decide what are you going to do next? What What is the next part of the puzzle, right? What is the logical uh, following that you're going to do? All right, so just to make sense of this, there's a parallel, right, for the activist here, right? A lot of activists, they go through the election, they have their favorite candidate, they're not the candidate themselves, but they see and when they lose, they're in a denial. They they refuse to accept that their candidate, one, wasn't the better candidate, or two, that they didn't do or or that they did everything right. They, they don't want to critique themselves. They don't want to be honest about what happened to, with themselves. And then it immediately transitions into anger, and they, they blame everybody else. They blame the Democrats. They blame the socialists. They blame the weak Republicans. They blame everybody else. And then the activist comes back to the idea that, well, maybe I'm mad at myself too, because I could have done more. I mean, it's a fair thing to do. A little uh, self-reflection. Again, in that parallel series here, then they move on to bargaining. Well, what could we have done more? I mean, should I have mortgaged the house? Should I have sold a car? Should, I mean, there's all these different things that rolls through people's heads. And I guess in fairness, that's, I would not expect an activist to think that way. And honestly, I don't think anybody that's in politics ought to be mortgaging their house, just to be clear. That being said, we have to deal with the idea that, hey, going forward, what can be done, right? That that's your that's your bargaining. You, you, as an activist, you're trying to critique and figure it out. If we would have done this, or we would have done that, 
And then, of course, there's the depression. The realization as an activist that a majority of people don't, in fact, agree with you. That sadly, at best, whatever position you hold to is a plurality. At least for the people that showed up in that election at that time. And that could be oh, very frustrating, very disappointing. Because that depression is what grips you. And you think to yourself, I don't know anybody that actually wants socialist, leftist, progressive things done. Well, they are there. They do exist. Uh, a good number of them are in the colleges and the high schools, quite frankly. Unfortunately, we've allowed for two generations of our posterity to be <laughs> messed up. But once you come out of that depression and you moved on to your acceptance, you know, as, as an activist, right? Now you can now you can really truly reflect and consider what are our options? What do we need to do? How, how is it that we can do better? All right. So now that I've kind of went through those five stages as, as an, a, a candidate and or an activist of the grief related to losing an election, let me take a minute because having been through this both as an activist and a candidate, and having been both successful and failed in both. I watched a video today uh, by a YouTuber by the name of Brandon Herrera. Now, he was a guy that ran against Tony Gonzalez down in Texas 23. Now, I got to be honest, I had no idea who this guy was before I found out he was running against Tony Gonzalez. Now, my initial knee-jerk reaction is, oh, that's fantastic. Somebody running against this guy. Now, my older, mature political self of, you know, 2024 looked at this guy. I'm like, oh, man, am I sure this is the guy that I want? Now, keep in mind, I didn't run across anything that was making me want to run the other way. And, I, and I've only watched, let's say, half a dozen videos. I'm sure there's plenty of other stuff out there. I didn't run across anything that made me want to run the other way. And there were a few things that were cringeworthy, if you will, as a 50 plus year old conservative activist that's, you know, kind of been there, done that, if you will. But as a 20 or 30 year old, I'm laughing my butt off at most of this stuff. And, I, and I'm embracing the counterculture look here. And I got to say, I understand completely why he came in at 400 votes shy of unseating Tony Gonzalez. Now, what's interesting is when I was at the state convention, apparently he was there. I, I didn't get a chance to run across him. And a, a piece of San Antonio is actually CD23. So uh, what's funny is I, I actually did see him come into the um, facility while I was having lunch one day. Um, and look, I'm not a fanboy, not, not for Mr. Herrera. And I, and that's no disrespect. Just, I don't know. I mean, I vaguely am aware of who the guy is. I found it fantastic that he was able to force him into a runoff. And part of me is sad that he didn't win. But the other part of me realizes that, you know, had he won, there's no guarantee he would have won the general. Whereas, unfortunately, like it or not, Tony's got a pretty solid chance of winning the general election in Congressional District 23 in Texas. But what does that mean? That means he's got two more years to prep, be prepared, and take another shot at Tony Gonzalez. Especially if Tony does the same bad actor stuff that he did the last two years. And hopefully uh, Brandy will mature just a, a little bit and put a little bit more, uh, let's say, uh, salt on, or seasoning, if you will, into his uh, positions. But when I watched the video, again, that I was referencing earlier, he got to the end and he said the reason he got involved, the reason he did this was he was motivated and inspired 
by Ron Paul in 2012. Now, look, I don't know this guy from Adam. I've watched maybe half a dozen, maybe totally a dozen videos at this point with this guy in it. And I found that hilarious, interesting, and honestly inspiring. I don't know anything about the guy other than his name. And he lives somewhere down by San Antonio, um, CD23. And Ron Paul was the reason that he cited. I saw he did an announcement at Young Americans for Liberty. Solid, right? So when I look at myself as an activist, as a, a former candidate, whatever, if somebody were to ask me, well, why do you do what you do? I too would say, well, Ron Paul was the major influence in that regard. There's a guy that won a congressional seat that kept winning this congressional seat. He would go to Congress and do the right thing and stand up for what he believed in and stayed as consistent as absolutely possible and took those hard no votes. I mean, even going back to the 90s when you had Newt Gingrich there was what was called the Ron Paul rule. Everybody had to do what Gingrich said, but, well, we left Ron Paul alone. Ron Paul's going to do what Ron Paul wants to do, and we're not going to change him. I mean, that's the kind of guy I want. That's To me, that is inspirational, and I wish we had dozens more like that. I mean, I would even be okay with the idea that we have center-left people that are in Congress but they had enough gumption, enough spine, enough courage of conviction that there was the whatever rule, right? Let's call it the Russ Feingold rule. Well, we we can't get Russ to go with us on this because this is important to him. He, he's going to stand on it. And, and I'm being gracious only because Russ Feingold, once upon a time, was a senator from the state of Wisconsin where I was originally born and raised. And while I thought he was... Politically wrong on 90% of the whatever. He was one of the few guys that voted against something when all of his party wanted him to vote for it or vice versa for that matter. And he did it on principle. Now, he didn't have the same principles that I have. And I'm sure that he was compromised in other ways. But I got to give credit where credit's due. I mean, if you got a guy that says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he actually holds to, I'm not going to do that. You got to admire that just a little bit. And, you know, we have the descendants, if you will, that I've referenced earlier in Congress still of Ron Paul and all the work that he's done. And it would have been nice to have one more guy that cites the good doctor as his motivation. So as I look at this, one of the things that I always recall is when you listen or hear Ron Paul speak, he doesn't talk down to people. He doesn't dismiss people. He includes as many people as he can. He articulates that when you believe in liberty, when you believe in freedom, that is empowering to those around you. There's no no reason to fear somebody that wants those things, right? Now, I believe that's an excellent message. I believe that's strong. Unfortunately, in today's day and age, that doesn't sell with a lot of young people. They don't care. They want their things, whatever it may be. They they want to get this something for nothing, if you will. And it's it's sad, but that's what they've been trained up to believe is normal. That's what that's what it is. And we have to overcome that. Now there's a lot of talk about well, hey, uh, you guys got new leadership in Collin County. What are you going to do to win? What are you going to do to fix things? Well, here's what I can tell you. Perhaps we should look at what we've been doing that's been successful and do more of that. And then look at what we've been doing that's been unsuccessful. Instead of double down on that situation, we ought to rethink it. We ought to come up with a better option or a different application. When we talk about empowering people, well, there's a whole lot more to winning elections than getting precinct chairs spun up. You have to get your other activists. You have to get your clubs bought in. You have to get your donor class excited. You have to get, quite frankly, the rest of the grassroots activated, interested, and excited. 
the the one thing that scares me most is we we do have a legit left of center some would say socialist elected representative in Collin County that goes down to Austin this person lives in HD 70 and I got to be honest from everything I've heard from people that actually live in Plano and interact with this person she's pleasant she's nice she's friendly she's relatable she's left of center She's got a few wackadoo ideas, but doggone it, people like her. So I ask myself, how do you beat somebody like that? Nobody seems to have that answer. And I'm really concerned because we've had two years to prepare, recruit, and build somebody up and prepare them to run for an excellent race to take that back from the left of center crowd. We didn't do it. We invested very little time and effort into it. Now, look, we've got a solid candidate running. And under other circumstances, he might be the right candidate for the job. But I'm going to tell you right now, if he beats 45%, I'll be thrilled. Excited. But I will also tell you HD70 is good for at least a 42% turnout from the Republican side. So that should be very concerning, right? That's your minimum threshold. It, it's it's supposed to be a purple seat. And we don't have a top tier candidate running. And I'm sorry, I don't need, mean to be mean. I don't mean to dismiss the guy. It is what it is. And we're going to do the best we can with him. But instead of rallying around this guy, instead of finding maybe somebody that we liked a little better, instead of investing into a really, really top drawer candidate to run for this race, we spent the vast majority of our time fighting amongst ourselves, trying to purify the party. Now, granted, there is a time for that. There is a place for that. There are candidates that let us down, a couple of whom have been dismissed, for better or for worse. That's, you know, you cross enough people, the, <laughs> or cross enough people, or cross things enough times, you won't win your reelection, and that is an appropriate consequence in politics. You would think perhaps the other incumbents that won their race would be highly interested in flipping 70 back over to the R column. But instead, with the exception of one, I, I have talked to one about this who has indicated interest. The, the other two, nothing. Now, granted, I don't really speak to the other two, so there may in fact be some concern or interest there. But you would think as an incumbent with an R after your name in Collin County, your number one interest would be making sure you get another person from our cadre going down from Collin County with a big R after their name. Just saying. So the likely outcome of November is we're going to lose that race again. And we're going to go through the very same cycle of grief. We're going to experience those five stages. And it's my sincere hope that one, the candidate... We'll be able to recover and move on and find a way to assist not just the party, but the conservative movement itself Two, that the activists that do pile on and do get involved between now and November, they don't get discouraged and they understand fully what happened here and why it's such an uphill battle and that they'll be prepared to hit the ground running come January because come January, we start looking for another person to run for that seat. And the third thing that I would like to say is, you know, now that I have a nice uh, role within the county party going forward, I am going to make it my mission amongst other missions. But one of my missions is going to be to find the solid, most likable, most <laughs> obvious candidate to run for HD 70 so that the next time things come around, we're going to be prepared. We're going to have an excellent candidate, well-known well-funded and hit the ground running and swinging with both arms. Now, again, you can't fault a guy that was willing to throw his hat in the ring. You can't fault a situation where all the noise and all the attention was on and everything else. You can't beat somebody up for that. But what I can say with, you know, hindsight, perfect hindsight, we really 
missed it this time. So along with me, I imagine there will be a great number of you going through those five stages of grief. And all I would say, we're all supposed to be on the same team. We're going to have differences of opinion. We're going to have differences of application. And we're going to have differences in the priorities of what's more important. But we generally always agree on the principles at play. So I'm going to ask you, whatever happens come November, we're going to lose some races and we're going to grieve over those. And after we grieve over those and you get to the point of acceptance, we need to be willing to have that hard conversation of what do we need to do differently to win in the next cycle. Perhaps we need to think about doing some things we haven't done before or changing up some of the processes to get there. Or perhaps open our mind on what's the best option for candidates for specific seats that we're looking to take back. I'm just saying, we have to be willing to talk about everything. That's part of the process and it's part of the acceptance. And with that, it is a Friday. So go enjoy yourself. Perhaps have an adult beverage if that's something you enjoy. Otherwise, enjoy a great meal. Hang with your spouse. Hang with your children. Or just enjoy a nice movie. And with that, this has been According to Callus. And I will see you on the other side.